the first session is on making sense of, on, um, of cryptography and certificates. Um, before we start, let me show what's not on, on, in this session. Uh, in this session, we are not going to talk about how you configure certificates in a web server. We are not talking about how you handle certificates in web API codes, nor are we talking about how you install your own certificate authority. This session is really about certificates. So what are these characters, these numbers? What, are, what is the meaning of that? And how do certificates actually work? So we are going to talk about encryption. That's a, an important part of cryptography, obviously. We're also talking about hashes, what hashes are, how they are calculated, how they are used, especially in certificates, because certificates are based on hashes. We also talk about what you need to do to manage crypto cryptography in your own application. And we also talk a little bit about the future of cryptography at the end, if you find the time. So let's go right in encryption. Encryption and cryptography are import increasingly important in today's world. We have cloud computing where data is stored in remote locations where data is accessed through different computer networks spanning the entire globe. So you need to encrypt data in transit. You need to encrypt data when it's stored. You need to encry encrypt data basically all the time. Also, remote access, especially in the COVID times, has become more important. You don't want to have data visible when you work from home. You, whenever you have remote access, whether that's just the screen or whether it's actually a VPN connection and you access data, you always want uh, this data to be encrypted so that no one else can actually access it. Cryptography is also not only used for um, encryption, but also to, imp uh, to have identity. Um, when everything is digital and every document is just a computer file, then it's easy to tamper. So you need to make sure that things are tamper-proof, that you can detect who changed something. And you can also have to know or be aware of um, who did something. You need to have a way to, to make sure that you know who created the, the document. And it obviously needs something that is um, uh, secure and something that is actually um, provable in court, for instance. Most companies <clears throat> also switch to digital processes, which has been in, uh, increased in speed um, in the past years when everyone has to work from home. So instead of working on paper, uh, a lot of companies are working on digital files. And here again, you have to make sure that only the people who need to have access actually can access files. Um, that data is not being stolen, something that happens quite a bit lately. And yeah, it's, it's just necessary to do this for all kinds of applications. Many countries um, enforce encryption and cryptography by law because, um, for instance, if you um, have a cash transaction, in many countries, you actually have to cryptographically sign the cash receipt so that the finance agencies know that it's that this amount was being exchanged and that you don't um, yeah, file or change your files later on and keep taxes. We also have a lot of privacy laws now. Um, in, in Europe, we have strict laws. Um, in the United States, California has strict laws. And those also require that you have data encrypted, that you make must make sure that no one else can access personal data. Uh, money laundering is another issue. Um, people want to avoid, countries want to avoid that you withdraw taxes that you own the country. So they make you um, sign, for instance, um, invoices digitally. Some countries um, require you to send invoices to other companies through a state of, of government agency. So you cannot even send a trans um, uh, invoice directly anymore. You have to go through the process of digitally signing your invoice and send it through an agency that then obviously uses this to um, 
um, to, to get your taxes up, uh, calculate taxes um, immediately. We also have something, well, even though in, in, in the war in Ukraine, this is not as apparent, but uh, war has moved to um, a lot of digital, of critical infrastructure, um, of uh, cyber war, of breaking into systems. So because our uh, digital infrastructure and our infrastructure is um, so and controlled remotely or controlled uh, by computers, if you break into the infrastructure of a country, you can basically shut it off. Um, if you turn off electricity, then a lot of bad things happen, including a lot of people die. Um, because paper is replaced by data, by electronic files, now it's even easier to steal data. You don't have to be in the place where this data is stored. You, you can access this from, from everywhere, from every country. Um, and you can also automatically mine data. So if, if you have data, if you have a lot of data, then you can search it um, instantly. In order to access important infrastructure, usually the attackers use the weakest link or they try to find the weakest link. And that's where it becomes important for Fox for Developer. Our applications are usually not uh, critical infrastructure applications. Our applications are not even often used by big corporations, but by tiny jobs, by small applications, by departments in, inside a big application. But your application might be the weakest link and might be a gateway into the infrastructure. If they get into your application and they are able to execute code, for instance, then your application might be the one that made way for, for people to get to other data. Or maybe your application contains data that can be used for social engineering, like a lot of personal information that is stored in, in a database. And then when someone knows this data, <coughs> they can use it. And even if all of this is probably not, not, not very likely for a Fox for application, still, if, if we are in the position um, of having hap this happening to us, to our application, being responsible for a major data leak or for major um, disruption, that's not a good thing to be in. That's not a good situation to be in. So even for us, it's important to pay attention to um, cryptography, to encryption, and keep our application up to date. So let's look at the history of encryption a little bit. Um, the first one, or one of the first one who used um, encryption was the Roman Emperor Julius Caesar. Um, it's called the Caesar cipher. It was once secure, it's not secure any anymore. Um, the way it works is that characters have been or were shifted to the left or to the right. So uh, like if you shift something to the right three times, the E becomes the B, um, the O becomes the L. So in this case, the number of characters you shift is um, the key that you use the password. This is called a substitution cipher. And sub substitution ciphers exist in different versions. More complex ones use the translation matrix. So A is replaced by Q and B is replaced by D or something else. That's harder to break because it's not only a single number that you have to remember, but it's harder to remember. You have to have remember all 26 characters. And the old times, these ciphers were not as um, elaborated. So another way was rolling a stripe of parchment around a stick and then writing on, on the stick um, in order to encode the, the, the message. In this case, the diameter of the um, stick is the key. You needed to have a stick the same size in order to decode the message, basically. If those substitution ciphers are very insecure, some people still believe that's a valid way to encrypt text, like Great Ship Karim in 2011 planned an attack on British Airways, and all communication happened with a variation of the Caesar cipher. Um, so, <clears throat> 
what do you do if you have encrypted text? How do you get clear text and you are not supposed to get the, the plain text? One approach is brute force. Brute force doesn't mean physical force, but it means to try every combination of a key. In order to try every combination of a key, you have to know what the algorithm is that has been used. If you don't know the algorithm, you cannot try the combination. The brute force takes a lot, lot of time because you really have to try every single combination. By chance, you might have a quick win because the first key you tried was the correct one, but usually you have to try quite a few of them. So that's the baseline for cryptographic att attacks. Everything that's faster than brute force is better and there's no attack that is slower than brute force because it doesn't make sense to have something that's elaborated and slower than trying everything. Brute force can be prevented by various measurements. One that is surprisingly often used is to keep your algorithm a secret called security by obscurity. That hasn't worked very well in the past and it will not work very well in the future too. The other way you can uh, do this is to increase the time it takes for trying all possible keys because you have to try all possible keys. And if it takes longer, then your algorithm is more secure. Your data is more secure. There are various ways to increase the, um, the time it takes for brute force attacks. One is to increase the number of keys you have to try. That's called the key length. If you have only a key of one digit, then there are only 10 options. If you have 10 digits, then you have a lot more options you have to try because you have to try every combination of every digit at every place. The increasing the key length is one mechanism, but you can also increase the time that is required for each iteration, depending on how the uh, algorithm works. For instance, you can add loops and inside the algorithm and do things over and over and over again. That often is used for hashing, where hashing is not done once, but is done thousands of times. The result of one iteration is feed into the next iteration, and then the hash is calculated on the hash and on the hash and on the hash and so on. Bitcoin is another popular um, system that uses um, increases the time required for iteration. Iteration. Basically, it bases on a hash value where you need to figure out a value that needs to be added to the current block in order to get a certain hash value. Hash value is a long number, and initially, only the last few characters of that hash value are required. But over time, more and more values are required in order to sign the, the block. So it takes more and more time and compensates the in, uh, improvement in computer technology. If you are running on a web server or on some server and the requests go through your system, what you can do is throttle authentication requests and only allow a certain number of attempts per second, per day, or whatever time period. Other ways of, of um, hacking and or de um, decrypting text or decrypting data is if data would be random, that would be a lot harder to do. But most data that we encrypt is structured in some way. So for instance, if, if you have a letter or a text document, we have um, this document is written in a natural language that is composed of words and sentences. If you have letters, they all start with some sort of salutation and some sort of closing. In the Second World War, they, the British actually used this because every German communication ended with Heil Hitler. So that was a known text. And by knowing what, it, what should be in this place, it gave a lot of hints of where, what data you can um, actually, or it gives a hint on, on the algorithm that you can use. Um, structured documents that we exchange often consist on XML or JSON, and those two have the same structure. They have XML documents are especially verbose so that certain names are repeated over and over and over again. 
So by knowing what you expect, you have another attack vector. That's the same is true for anything that is a known file format, like a DBF file. If you know that's a DBF file or you know it's a docx file, then you know certain things about that document. Like docx files always start with the zip code and as well, the zip identifier because it's a zip file. If you know it's a language, um, then you can also use frequency analysis to break into encryption. Every language ha that has letters uses letters in a different frequency. So in English and in German and in Czech, the most common letter is E. In English followed by T and A, in German followed by N and I, and in Czech by O and A. You notice that Czech is the only one where the three most common letters are actually vowels and not consonants, despite the um, perception of the language. So if you have something that has a one-to-one -one relationship, like um, the Caesar cipher, you can just count the number of, uh, um, of occurrences of certain letters and match them with known frequencies, and then you actually have the plain text. If single letters or the frequency of single letters doesn't work, you can also use bigrams and trigrams. Like for instance, in English, Q is relatively um, often used, but it's always only, mostly only used in the combination of Q and U or ACQ. There's a few other combinations where the letter Q is used beside those. Also, like uh, in terms of in terms of bigrams, th is much more common than tp in English. It's different in other languages. Um, if if you want to prevent frequency analysis, you have to make sure that the the text is just encrypted differently. So you should use a different password after each encryption step. So you have to work through the encryption process from the beginning. That's what Enigma has been used in, or has been using in World War II. So um, every time the one character was encrypted, it used a different key and you needed to know the initial key in order to decrypt the text. Let's talk about asymmetric encryption because Every encryption we so far have talked about is symmetric. You use the same key to encrypt and decrypt. There's two ways where you have asymmetry, asymmetry in encryption. One is encrypting in time, which means you encrypt something today and then you want to decrypt it at a later time. And the other is encryption in space where you encrypt something, send it, and then basically decrypt it in the same moment. If you encrypt something in time, you have to make sure that it's safe enough for the time it's supposed to be stored. So encrypted data that is in a database has a different requirement for encryption than data that is just transferred and transmitted to another computer. So let's look at how public private key encryption works. Public private key encryption uses the, uh, um, a mechanism or an algorithm that uses a different key for encryption than for decryption. So I have a public key and a private key. It actually doesn't matter what key is what key, it's just two parts. And you use one key to encrypt and you use the other key to decrypt. So if you want to send me some text, we exchange the keys in advance. I give you, I give you my public key you give me your public key and you use, if you want to send data to me encrypted, you use my public key to encrypt data and only I with my private key can decrypt it. In order to send data back to you, I cannot use my private key because you cannot decrypt it. I, I use your public key. So we always have two pairs of keys in this case. I encrypt data with your public key and only you with your private key can decrypt that data. That's the foundation of a public-private key encryption. The algorithms used for that are RSA and Diffie-Hellman. The names are based on the inventor's initials. 
RSA was created by James H. Ellis and Clifford Cox in 1973. And together with Malcolm Williamson, they invented the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. Something doesn't add up there, and that's all three people made a particular choice in their, with their job. They all work for the communications, government communication headquarters, which is the NSA of the British uh, government. So anything they invented in 1973 was only shared within the government communication headquarters and with the NSA. And both organizations came to the conclusion that this is not useful. So they just left it and nobody could talk about it until 19, 1997, when James H. Ellis already had died, they could talk about that they invented us a, a long time ago. Therefore, someone else did it a couple of years later. Martin Hellman, who was a professor at Stanford, met Whitfield Diffie in 1974 and hired him in 1975. Together, they published a paper in 1976 called New Directions in Cryptography, where they talked about um, public key, public-private key encryption. This was an important document or important publication at that time because most cryptography was based on military use and nobody could talk about what you did for the military or for secret service. And even uh, laboratories that were researching, research centers that were researching cryptography often did so by being paid, uh, being paid by public um, organizations. So there was not a lot of publications that could be published freely and read by everyone. And this was one of the first and one of the most important ones. What diffie hellman left open is the one-way function. And that's the result of Ron Rivest, Eddie Shamir, and Leonard Edelman. They came up with a, a, with a function that makes it easy to calculate in one way, but it's almost impossible to do the inverse, to have the result and then find the original values. As A was invented in 1977 during Passover, they had quite a bit of manuscript swine, uh, were hungover, couldn't sleep. So what do we do when you can't sleep? You invent a record-breaking, groundbreaking algorithm that changes the world in the next 50 years. So that's when they came up with a function. And MIT patented it in 1983. And RSA, the three of them founded a company called RSA Security Inc., which most of you probably know by the Secure ID token. The company has been bought by EMC and is now owned by Dell. In 1995, RSA founded Digital Certific Certificates International, which later was renamed into VeriSign. So this company changed quite a bit in, in the world of the internet and in a lot of other things. If you want to use RSA in Virtual Fox Pro, please do not use underscore script VCX. It's based on an old Windows XP cryptographic API. In Avista, Microsoft has released um, the crypto API next generation. Um, and I have written a program called Fox Crypto NG, which is on GitHub. It's available there that implements all these functions directly in Foxpo. You don't need a DLL, you don't need a FLL, you don't need some .NET code, just this program and you have all these cryptographic primitive functions um, available. RSA is based on a key size. The key size, you can freely choose the key size you want in steps of eight bits. So one byte. If you are required to encrypt data based on NIST regulations, and this data is supposed to be stored not no longer than 2030, you can use 2048 bits. If anything that's stored longer than 2030 has to use 3K bits. This key size defines the performance of the encryption process, and it's not linear. So on my machine, if I encrypt something with 2,448 bits, it takes 300 milliseconds. If I triple the amount of bits roughly to 6,400 bits, 
it already takes 42 seconds. So you have to choose a key size that meets the security requirements, but also is performant enough. RSA has a couple of issues. First of all, it's a fixed length cipher. So everything, you, you can only encrypt data up to the length of your key. So if you have a 2048-bit key, you can encrypt 2048 bits, that's all. If you have shorter input, you need to pair it. And the most or biggest problem is actually RSA is really, really slow. So what happens in practice is that we combine RSA and AES. AES is another encryption algorithm that's symmetric. So um, we use the same key for encryption and decryption. The problem we need to solve is that both sides need to know the key, but it should not be intercepted in some way. We, we cannot exchange it beforehand, especially on a web server. You cannot talk to the owner of a web server before you connect to the web server. So we need to find a way to exchange the key in a, in a secure way. So what happens is um, if I want to send you something, I request your public key, which is available. Then I generate a random key, completely random 256-bit key. Encrypt it with your public key and send it to you. So only you can decrypt it with your private key. And then I use that random key to send you AES 256 encrypted data that you can decrypt with the random key that you could decrypt it with the private key that you have. So that's how SSL or TLS and internet works. There's a brief exchange handshake where they exchange a random password that is used for this communication only and use um, public private key to exchange the password. And then they switch to something completely different. A is, ex is extremely fast. It's a symmetric cipher. These days it's built into hardware. It's every computer processor, most hardware can encrypt and decrypt AES in hardware very, very, very quickly, gigabytes of data per second. AES has three levels. AES 256 is suitable for top secret in the United States. Um, if you have something that needs, that needs to be secret, you can also use AES 128. Obviously, it's faster to, to encrypt data in AES 128, but it's not as secure. AES was originally called Rinder, which is Dutch for Rhine Valley. If you could pronounce Dutch correctly, I can't. It was created in 1998 by Vincent Riemann and John Damon from Belgium. The name um, is also based on their name. So they used a variation of their last name to form the, the Rinder name. And NIST used it to replace DAS and 3DAS to encrypt algorithms that have been used uh, since the 1977s with um, Rindel and renamed it to AES at that size, at that time. Um, AES comes in three block sizes, 128 bits, 192 bits, and 256 bits. Um, in Foxball, you can, again, use FoxCrypt to NG uh, to encrypt and decrypt AES. It's a block cipher. It's, it's always block, um, encrypting 16 bytes. You cannot encrypt four bytes or five bytes. So what happens is, uh, first of all, let's look at what this looks like in Foxball. So when you have the uh, FoxCrypto NG, you just instantiate the class and it has an encrypt AES um, function, a method, and you pass in the data and the password. So the data is Foxball Rocks 12, and the password is uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. The length, length of the text, you notice I'm passing in 15 characters and 16 characters, and the resulting length is 16 characters and 32 characters. You have to keep this in mind if you store data or if you encrypt fields. You, you always have to pad it to a um, multiple of, six, of 16. You cannot 
encrypt a C1 field into a C1 encrypted field. The padding is done using a specific algorithm, PKCS, which means public key cryptog cryptography standard, has a suite of algorithms, and number seven is used to pad values. And the algorithm used is we add n bytes with a value of m. So for instance, if we have Fox Pro rocks, then we have three characters missing to the, the full 16. So it's padded with three, three, and three. If we have Foxball rocks one, two, we only have one character missing, so we have a one. This obviously means that there always has to be at least one padding character. So if we um, pad Foxball rocks one, two, or three, which is 16 characters, we cannot use the, the full text because that would mean I have uh, 33, well, hex 33 characters that are missing. So I add another block of 16 bytes, padded with 16 decimal or 10 hex. So that's why um, the algorithm is switching from 16 bytes to 32 bytes results um, after when, it, when you go from 15 to 16 bytes in data that you encrypt. There are also two modes of operation for AES. One is called electronic cookbook and the other is called cipher block chaining, ECB and CBC. Let me show you the effect of both. Electronic cookbook means that each block is encrypted separately. So if I have FoxPro rocks one, two, three, FoxPro rocks one, two, three, both 16 bytes long blocks, each 16 byte block is encrypted to the same content. So it's, it, it looks exactly the same because it's always using the data and the key in some way to produce the encrypted result. That obviously isn't a good idea if we have images. So let's look at this image. 16 bytes is four pixels um, if you have ARGB. So if I take a picture like this uh, penguin and encrypt it using ECB mode, you can see the, in the middle that the encrypted image isn't really encrypted, even though it's using AES, which is a government certified algorithm. And that's because a lot of the pixels are the same and they are encrypted the same way. If you use another mode that we cover right in the next slide, then you get something that looks like pseudo randomness. Um, if you want to see this, the source uh, it's, um, of this image, um, please be aware that the link that is on the slide, which I have to use in order to use the image, is not suitable for work or for small children. Cyber block chaining is using an extra step. It's taking an initialization vector and the plain text and XORing both. By default, it's using zeros. And plain text XOR of zero is plus plain text. Then it's using the key to encrypt the block. And you get ciphertext. And that ciphertext is then used for the next block as and XOR with that. So the result or the data that you encrypt is different from the, the previous block, even so the plain text is the same. And you always have to decrypt things beginning from the first block to the end. You cannot just decrypt something in the middle because every block is depending on, dependent on the previous block. Cypher block chaining is the only way to actually make sure that data is encrypted correctly. Because if you have an XML string and you use ECB, then obviously all the tags are encrypted the same way and you see a lot of, of competed, uh, repeated text and you can use the other mechanisms to break in that text because you know what, it's, what it could be. Um, if you do the same thing, um, with Foxball works um, one to three in, in CBC operation mode, then you get something completely different, as you can see. It's not repeated anymore. Um, in Visual Foxball, you again use um, FoxScript and G. And you notice there are three different algorithms AES 128, 192, and 256. The way that you use the algorithm is depends on the password length. 
If your password is 16 characters long or 128 bits, then AES-128 is used. If it's 32 uh, characters long, then AES-256 is used. So the password length has to be one of the three ones, 16, 24, 32. It cannot be anything else. It, um, it's, those are the only option you have. And then the algorithm is picked automatically based on the key lengths. So how, or oh, any questions? Let's, let's stop here. Um, there's only one question. Okay. Uh, if I have a public key to encrypt, how come I can't decrypt it back? That is based on the algorithm. It's based on factoring. So basically, the the one key is a prime, the other key is a prime, and the the algorithm uses the the, the um, product of of both. And the function that I used are being used is. Um, you, you, you have to reverse things. Just like if you multiply two numbers, you have to um, uh, take the, the, the square root. Or, and one of the operations is, is easier than to do than the other. It would require factoring, then result into two primes. So you have a resulting large number. You have to figure out what the two primes were. And this takes a lot more time than multiplying on regular computers. Okay. That's it for questions. So um, now that we need to fix password lengths, how can we produce that password? And that's where hashes come in. Hashes or a hash function turns an arbitrary amount of data into fixed length data. Originally, it was used for hash tables. So if you want to have uh, to look up something quickly, you would calculate a hash out of the data and then use that hash as the index. So you don't have to look or search at a table of data or an index um, in order to retrieve data. Foxpo has a built-in hash function called sys27, or 20 or 7. It's actually a CRC16 or CRC32 function. It is hashing, so it turns any data into a 16-bit or 32-bit function. What these functions are not, a cryptographic hash functions. A cryptographic hash function is a function that has no matter what you put in, it never produces the same result. So it obviously needs to be a, have a lot long key than just 16 bits because you can imagine there's quite a few date inputs that have the same 16 bit CRC value. But um, that, this is not true for a cryptographic hash function. As soon as you have a collision, a cryptographic hash function is considered to be insecure and should not be used. That's what happened to MD5, for instance. People found ways to produce or have two different inputs and produce the same hash value. So if you modify input, you could have created a hash value that's same and that's, uh, as we see in, in certificate, certificates, it's not really good. Cryptographic hash functions also have vastly different output for slightly different inputs. If I change just one character, I get a totally different hash value and not a slightly different hash value. So I have no a way of slightly modifying things in order to figure out what, what the original data could be. Hash functions do not have a very long shelf life. They are outdated pretty quickly. MD5 is outdated. Short and 224 was only published in 2004 and is already outdated. Short 256 and short 512 that we are using today um, <clears throat> are insecure. Um, there are certain variations of um, the short algorithm, 512, 20, 24, uh, 20, 224, and short, short 512, 256. Both have been published in 2012 and they are still okay. And also in 2014, Shaw 3 has been published and that's okay to use as well. So you can imagine if you have code that is older than 2012, your code cannot be secure. Your hash function cannot be secure because that's when the only secure hash functions that are available now have been invented.
support of hashing in Windows is unfortunately not as up to date as you work with. The crypto next generation has no support for SHA-3, short three. Um, the short 256 and 512 um, algorithms that are supported are susceptible, susceptible for length extension attacks. Uh, <clears throat> so that you really, for sometimes, you, depending on what you use, you might have to use a different library. But then if you are working for public agencies or anything, you, you have to make sure that the algorithm that um, is approved, SHAW, which is the approbation of secure hash algorithm, is developed and approved by the National Security Agency, NSA, in the United States. There's another family of, of um, hash algorithms that is called message digest, MD, which is MD5, or there's also MD4 and MD3, which has been designed by Professor Ronald Invest of MIT and the one who invented the RSA algorithm. In Foxball, you can use the hash SH uh, SHA-256 um, function of Fox Crypto NG to calculate the hash. And that also happens to be a good key for encrypt AES because it's a 256-bit value. So no matter what the password is that you put in, you always get a 256-bit key that you can use to encrypt data with AES. You usually should combine a sort for added security. That means you add data um, to the data you are hashing. So you have your data, you add some other data and hash both. So people need not only to know what algorithm you use, but also need to, need to know what the sort was in order to um, calculate the, the password or the calculate the hash. <clears throat> the reason for that is that you obviously can pre-calculate hash values because the, the, it's a standard algorithm. There's only data turned into hash. There's no password in between. So any data is, data is always, um, results always in the same hash value. If you use the same data, you always get the same hash value. So if you want to um, avoid that uh, hash tables can be used, you modify the data by adding a sort. And then you have a different value and that is not uh, in, a, in a hash table because it would be the combination of every data and every sort that would need to be pre-calculated. <clears throat> if you want to store passwords in the Fox application, the way not to do it is to have an LC password variable and assign a string uh, to that variable. Um, because there are tools out there that scan code exe files and look at what looks like a password. And passwords are not random data, but they often have a pattern. So that pattern can be heuristically detected. So one way in, in Foxport to um, generate random passwords, and you have to remember that the passwords you use in your application don't have to be remembered by a user. They can be any binary data. <clears throat> so one way is most of Fox applications have some sort of embedded files, like icon files, image files, which you can access from Foxpro directly using the file to string function. So you can just read one of your files that are embedded, take a certain segment of that file, add a sort and hash it, and then use that result as your password. So it's never been in clear text. It's, it's, it's something that doesn't identify as, as a password. If you have to write the password in, uh, in your application because you cannot use an embedded file, then it's safer to actually write it in code. Use CHR plus CHR plus CHR uh, because that also doesn't put the password in code. It puts generates code that doesn't look like a password. It looks like code. And also don't save the password in, in a variable. Always use a function that returns the password directly and then use that function in, in an API call or method call or whatever. So don't write something like LC password equals get password 
and then use AC password and the and um, the method call. Always use get password in the method call directly. This avoids that your error lock leaks any information uh, like the password. <clears throat> any questions about hashes? The only question <laughs> is, uh, why will quantum computing make all symmetric hashes obsolete? I could ask chat GPT, but I think you're smarter. Um, we, we talk about this in, at the end of the session. So it's, I have a slide for that. It's, I don't know if I'm smarter than chat GPT, but uh, I try my best. Okay, <clears throat> so if you combine hashes, Um, with data, then um, we can get to certificates. So certificates, we, we've talked about how we exchange um, our password by you send me a public key and um, I encrypt my random password with your public key and send it to you and you can decrypt it. You are the only one who can decrypt it because you have the private key. Now, the man in the middle attack is a way where, in, in this case, I send you my public key. Someone in the middle intercepts, or you send me your public key. Someone in the middle intercepts your public key. And instead of forwarding it, they just send me their public key. So I use their public key to create a random password and encrypt it with their public key. Because it's their public key, they can decrypt it with their private key, they can save the random key that I sent them, or I sent you actually, and then encrypt it again with your public key. And you can decrypt it with your private key and use it for communication. And none of us knows that someone else in the middle has um, intercepted the random key that we use for exchange. Because <clears throat> we always use the public key that was sent to us and we couldn't, well, we haven't found a way to validate this. So what we need to do is to add some sort of identity. One way is, the, is that you sent me your name and your public key. So I know that this message was sent by you. But then the man in the middle could just replace the public key with theirs. So I get something that says it's you and the name is the one I expect, but the key is not. It's still someone else. So we need to add more measurements to that. So what about if you send me your name, your public key, and then hash both data? You calculate a hash that we, using a hash algorithm that we agree on or that you tell me what to use. So I can verify that your name and your public key matches the hash value by recalculating the hash. Problem again is the man in the middle could replace the public key. Now they have to recalculate the hash, but because the algorithm is known, I get data, I get the name that I expect, I get a different hash than you sent and a different key than you sent, but the hash is matches, so I assume the key is correct. So we need something more. So let's make it more complicated. You sent me your name, your public key, a hash of both, and then you encrypt the hash with your private key, which only you have. So I know that you encrypted the hash value. So what if the man in the middle replaces the public keys with theirs, recalculates the hash and encrypts everything with their private key? Then I would decrypt the hash with their public key, recalculate the hash, think that everything is okay, but the key would still be wrong. So no matter what we do, whenever we only use two parties, you never get a secure mechanism because the man in the middle always can exchange data and uh, because we have no way of trusting each other key keys. So that's where third parties um, join uh, the game. 
So you send your name and your public key to a third party. And the third party calculates hash out of the name and the of new public key and uses their private key to um, um, encrypt it. So the, the, you get back um, a token from the third party that is encrypted with the private key of the, of the third party. So only the third party can encrypt this token this way, but everyone who has the public key of the third party can verify this. So you send me your name, your public key, and the token from the third party. And then I can decrypt the token with the public key of the third party, recalculate the hash value, and that in this case, it should match. So whenever the man in the middle tries to change something, they would need to have this, the, the private key of the third party in order to recalculate all elements in there. So this third party is making sure that someone else cannot pretend to be you and change something. They always can only, they only can change everything. So if, if you send your name and public key to me and it's changed, either the, the, the hash value wouldn't match or it would be signed with a different um, private key, which the third party public token then, public key then would not match. This thing is called a digital signature. So if we have data like, like a name plus a public key for private uh, public private key exchanges, create a hash value out of this data using whatever hash algorithm is secure and encrypt the hash with the private key, we have a token that we call a digital signature. If you take your name, your public key, and a, dig a digital signature from a third party signing your name and your public key, the combined data is what we call a certificate. That third party we are talking about is called the certificate authority. The certificate authority has certificates or the certificate that is being signed by a, certi a certificate authority proves that the certificate has been seen and signed by the certificate authority. It does not mean that it's correct. It does not mean that it's um, everything is, is what it seems to be. It just means that the certificate authority has seen that certificate and decided to sign it and handle that token, the key back to whoever uh, provided the certificate. Certificate authorities issue digital certificates that they are, have, been signing, have been signing with their private key. So we always have a public key of that certificate authority, but um, it's signed by the private key. So that private key is one important piece of information. So what happens if the man in the middle decides to create their own certificate authority, they could just have another public certificate um, and sign their keys with their our own private key. And if we would go and use the data that we have been sent to figure out what the certificate authority is and where to find that public key and then download the public key from whatever places has been given to us, then we would be able to replace the certificate that's been used. So it's really important that certificates or the public key of certificate authorities are exchanged beforehand. So we both need to know what the public key of the certificate authority is before we use data to encrypt or before we encrypt data, before we use that certificate. And these certificates that identify the certificate authority are called root certificates. And they are always distributed ahead of time in operating systems and in, in browsers. 
In Windows, they are placed in the Trusted Root Certification Authority Certificate Store. That's where you find all the certificates that are being trusted. If a certificate is in that store, it's, it's a trusted certificate. If a certificate is not in that store, then the certificate authority is not accepted on that system. So it's very important to have this list of certificates being correct. So it's, it's the browser vendors and the um, oper operating system vendors uh, have the responsibility to only um, distribute root certificates that are trustworthy. Because as, if someone manages to sneak in a root certificate of their own uh, or a certificate authority, then they can sign other people's um, certificates and the system will believe it's a valid certificate. The process of you applying for a certificate by a certificate authority, and that's a lot of certificates in, in, in there, is called a certif Certificate Signing Request, or CSR. A CSR consists of your name your, or other data, like your web server address or anything, your public key, and your digital signature that has been signed with your private key. So it's the by looking at the using your public key, the certificate authority can validate that you are the one who signed that um, signature or that certificate request because um, it matches the hash value. So you have to have a public key and a private key. You sign the hash value or the digital signature with your private key. You send your name, your public key, and your private key to the certificate authority. And the certificate authority then has to verify your identity, depending on what kind of certificate you want. Technically, certificates are all the same. This, it's data, it's a public key, and it's a digital signature. There's nothing special about a certificate um, from a technical perspective. You can even specify different um, algorithms in there. However, um, what the certificate authority verifies is very different. So, so that is one of the reasons that certificates can be very inexpensive up to extremely expensive. So one of the things is the company, if you have a name or your own name or your company name, someone actually verifies that this name is correct, that it's your company, that it's your personal name, so the same applies for website addresses. If you want to register a, cer a certificate for a server, you have to prove that you actually own that website. So it's always, um, you either have to show control of what you claim to own, or you have to show paperwork to prove that you own the thing you claim to own. Control is what's done with websites. Um, you sent a certificate request to the certificate authority, and they sent you something back that you have to put onto your web server. And then they try to access that web server using the address that you provided and that they are certifying. If you have the possibility to put a file on that web server, the authority believes that you have, that you own that web server, that you own that uh, site. For names, if like, if you have a certificate um, for code signing where you use a company name or personal name, you often have to show more, like you have to send a copy of an ID card or driver license, or you have to um, present the, the paper for incorporation or to, to prove that it's your company and not you are not pretending to be the company. You, are not, you cannot pretend to be Microsoft Inc. Um, and get a certif certificate that says this is certified for Microsoft. You can only get a certificate for your own company and you have to prove that. So the, one of the surprising things is that certificates completely based on trust. Even in this world where countries are not 
very friendly against each other, where there's not a lot of trust between countries, we still have a lot of these things based on trust. We trust vendors and framework, uh, framework um, browser manufacturers and operating systems manufacturers to only distribute good root certificate, certificates, not to sneak in a certificate that is malicious. We also trust all these um, certificate authorities to keep their private keys a secret, to not let anyone know what the private key is. And we also trust uh, certificate authorities that they validate the identities of what they certif certify so that not someone can pretend to be someone and get certified. So that's a lot of trust and it surprisingly works worldwide because if you don't have a root certificate for the, the other party, you cannot communicate encrypted. So without the root certificate, you could not send messages to China, to Russia, to other countries, uh, because there's no way to validate thing, these things. So root certificates are international. It's a worldwide system. If you use crypto cryptography in your own application, there's some things you need to do. First of all, most countries have governmental entities that are responsible for cybersecurity for um, anything that deals with um, encryption and yeah. So for instance, in Canada, there's the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. Um, the, you have the PowerPoint slides and if you click on the link, you get to that page directly. In Germany, we have the Bundesamt für Sicherheit and Informationstechnik. And the United States of America have the Computer Security Resource Center. Those government ent entities usually have rules on how they consider to be, or what they consider to be a secure way of, of dealing, what, what they consider to be the minimum requirements. Like when you have to encrypt data, what systems you are able to use, uh, who's supposed to know things, how your computer system needs to be structured physically and also from, from software. So you need to be aware of the regulations in your country and in the countries where you are shipping software in order to make sure that your software matches the requirement. Because if it doesn't, usually that can be used against you if something happened and you didn't meet the minimum standards for security, then you're often liable. You also need to monitor algorithms. So um, in order to be able to monitor algorithms, you obviously need to know what algorithm you use. It's easier actually to, to monitor these things now that we have the internet and Wikipedia because there's for the common algorithms, that's a web page. And if you scroll down all the way down here, you see some easy to understand tables. You see MD5 as an algorithm and you see that it's red for collision attacks and it's red for extension attacks. So both are insecure, red is insecure. SHA-0 and SHA-1 both are insecure too. And then you see in SHA-2, collision attacks have not been found. So there have not been cases where you have two different inputs and have the same hash value. So you can, you, you can be secure that whenever you have a hash value that matches the input that you expect. However, SHA-2 has had ex length extension attacks, which is a particular type of attack. So they are not that secure. The one that have both green are the one that are secure. So you want to use SHA-512 slash 224 or 256. Um, as a hash algorithm or SHA-3, which is not available directly in Windows. So those green ones are the good ones. Those red ones you should avoid. Uh, encryption. So, so that's, um, we also have a list of hash function security overview where other hash functions are 
given like MD5 and SHA-1 here again, SHA-256 uh, is has a two block collision, but it's still considered to be secure. And you see some of the olders uh, or less common hash functions, MD4 or MD2, Panama, functions that we have probably not used. Uh, for also for those, you can find out whether they are secure or not. This page changes over time. So you need to review it regularly. And the way you do this is, First of all, you keep a list of algorithms that you rely on. You need to know what algorithms you are using. And that includes any third party that you are using. If you use a third party library that is encrypting data, you have to know what algorithm they use so that you know whether that algorithm is secure. Because uh, security changes, things that have been secure at one point, like MD5, become insecure uh, later on. So you, if you have an application that you maintain, you need to review them at least annually. Schedule an annual secu security review and look through the algorithms that you use and see if they are still secure, if there's anything um, that happened with that algorithm. And if you store hashes in a table, always keep track of what algorithm you used to create that hash value because over time, you have to change the algorithm. And you want to know that if, because the thing is, you can, unless you have the data, you cannot recalculate the hash value. So if you switch to a more secure hash value, you have to have the original data in order to calculate the hash value. Um, one of the things or situations where this is not possible is when you have passwords, because you don't store a password ever. You don't encrypt it. You don't store it unencrypted. You just store a hash value for that password that has been sorted with an individual value that it belongs to that password. So if you change from, say, MD5 to SHA-256, um, you cannot recalculate all the hash values. You have to wait for the user to log on. And then in the table, notice that you are using or that user is still using a hash value that has an old, old algorithm. So you have to verify the password using the old algorithm and then update the hash value of the new algorithm and store that new information along with the hash value. So always know which accounts, for instance, could be insecure because if the hash value is too insecure, you might have to delete that user because you even, even if they know the password, somebody might have figured out a way to create a password that has that hash value. So it's the old hash value is not secure enough to verify at for once or one time that the password is correct or that the person knows the password. So it's important to keep track of what you are using in uh, cryptography. So let's talk a little bit about the future. Predictions are always hard, especially when they concern the future. So what we see now is that quantum uh, computers are able to do things that regular computers are not being able to do. I do actually not really know the math behind quantum mechanic. That's, that's not my, I'm, I'm writing software. I'm a database developer, software developer. I'm not a quantum engineer. But from what I know, it, the quantum computers use a different mechanism or different process or different way of calculating things. A regular computer needs to have a step-by-step -step, um, list of commands that it's executing. So there's a, a linear process that might not be as linear on today's computers, but there's a linear process that's being followed from the beginning to the end. Whereas quantum processing can do things at the same time um, by the magic of quantum sand. Yeah. So things that are hard to do if you do it in a linear way become easier if things happen at the same time, like factoring. Factoring is one of the problems that is hard to do in, in 
regular code takes years or thousands of years or millions of years to, to uh, take a long number, like a number that has 2,048 digits, and turn it into the two primes that multiplied result in that number. Um, quantum computers are supposed to do this much faster. Sometimes it's only eight times faster. Sometimes it's really different and a really different process. So they at least pose a danger towards um, our existing algorithms because our existing algorithms are all based on the idea that something you can do that is easy to do in one way, like multiplying two numbers, but it's hard to do it the other way around, like factoring to uh, one number into two. Um, so quantum computers are actually um, a concern of the cryptography community for over 20 years now. And the, the process of creating post-quantum crypto uh, cryptography has started around that time. In 2016, the NIST, um, a US institution for standardization, started the standardization process for post-quantum cryptography. There have been three rounds so far. And in last year in July, four algorithms have been selected as post-quantum cryptography. So these are the algorithms you will be using in the near future when quantum computing is powerful enough to break existing code. Right now, we have round four running, um, which is um, evaluating public key encryption algorithms. So the, the algorithms that you have to deal with in the future are separated into three groups. There's key encapsulation, which says how you encapsulate the key. There's the signing process that is done by hashes so far. And then there's the public key encryption, which is the one-way function that is used for encryption and cannot be used for decryption. So the current or the future algorithms that we use, um, are, two of them are from a cryptographic suite for algebraic lattice, lattices. Lattices is a mathematical uh, system that is based on an infinite number of points um, that are spread across, and then they try to find out what the shortest vector is, for instance. Cryptographic suite for algebraic lattices is uh, abbreviated as crystals, and the key encapsulation method is called crystals Kyber. We have Kyber 512, which is roughly equivalent in security to AES 128, and then up to Kyber 1024, which is roughly equivalent to AES 256. So Kyber 512 would be um, for secure and if, if, it's, if it's top secret, then you have to use Kyber 1024. The name really comes from Star Wars, from the Kyber crystals used there. The signature scheme that uh, there are three that have been chosen. One is crystals dilithium, which is a secure algorithm to sign uh, messages. It's based on Star Trek. So in the future, you depend on Star Trek and Star Wars being working together uh, to secure your communication. The other one is Falcon, which is just the abbreviation of fast Fourier lattice, lattice based complex signatures over NTRU. I have no idea what NTRU is, so, but that's the name. The mass behind that is all published, but it's really complex and it's so far beyond my ability. And then there's also Sphinx or Sphinx Plus actually. It was originally Sphinx and then changed into one of the rounds, it changed to Sphinx Plus. Uh, Sphinx is an abbreviation for stateless, practical, hash-based, incredibly nice, collision resi resilient signatures. So those are the algorithms you will be using in the future instead of AES. Um, and our MD5 or RSA. Uh, so you will be seeing those. And if your application is running another 10 years, 
you probably have to deal with them and at some point change your code to use them. There are already libraries implementing those. They are not yet in Windows, but at some point they have to be in Windows so that Windows can be used um, in, in like the NSA or other um, public agencies. And there's also the issue of AI. Um, AI is producing images right now that looks photorealistic. So you cannot trust an image anymore. So what I think could happen in the future is that camera vendors or manufacturers implement a trusted platform module like we have in computers or um, in, in, in cell phones. And if the camera detects that it has not been tampered, then it will sign images using that hardware platform, using a private key that is specific to the camera so that you can know that this picture has been taken with that camera and you can actually identify which camera it was. So you know that this image is the original one. Obviously, it will not never be the one that we see because that's been Photoshopped. Um, but at least we have a proof of that a, a picture was taken by a camera and not completely invented by AI. Right now, text and images are more popular in, in with AI, but AI is also cap capable of creating realistic audio in real time. So it's it is able to pretend to be someone else. It speaks with the voice of someone else. So um, at some point in the future, you might get a call it sounds like someone you know, but it's completely completely artificial. And you don't know if that the call you get is actually the person you, you think um, they're calling. So what I can imagine is that at some point, we will have little devices that have a private key and keep all the public keys of people that we trust. And then going back to the time of modems and fax devices, they will send cryptographic messages using audio signals using a little, a little, a few beeps to verify that the other party at least has the device with the private key of that public key that you trust. So what we learned today is what encryption is, what hashes are, what certificates are, and what you need to do to manage the complexity of cryptography in your own application. So thank you very much. And please remember to fill out your evaluations. Any questions uh, are answered in the Q&A session afterwards. So thank you very much for attending and see you in the Q&A room in a few seconds.